for great ideas and practical tools you can start using tomorrow to grow your business and separate you from the competition, you've come to the right place. If you're into B2B marketing and sales, then welcome to the one and only B2B marketing and sales podcast with over 60 and counting total years in the trenches of businesses, small and large. They have a plethora of knowledge and experience that generate you more leads, capture more clients, ring up more sales. Well, doggone it. Just make you more money. How about that? Always thought-provoking, yet dubiously entertaining. Please welcome to their respective microphones across three time zones, your co-ringmasters, the Dave Loomis, and not the rock star, Steve Miller. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the B2B Marketing and Sales Podcast with uh, none other than yours truly, Dave Loomis. I'm here again um, without my co-host, Steve Miller. But that's okay, because I'm joined with um, one of my good friends from a long time, uh, Jim Gilmore, who is, uh, well, there's a long list of things. First, I'll say welcome, Jim. Well, thank you. <laughs> Jim Jim and I have known each other for, for quite some time on, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, right now, uh, Jim wears a lot of hats. Um, he's a professor at Case Western Reserve. University in uh, Cleveland, which also has Weatherhead School of Management, and he teaches in both of those uh, organizations. He founded a, uh, an, a consulting firm called Strategic Horizon uh, it, that had um, has had a great run of success over the years, including some very, very cool events. And uh, he, he's probably most known for um, a book. Um, not to mention a Harvard Business Review article, which is it's still in the top 10 of most reprints or requested. Who knows? It's it, I, I would think it's one of their <laughs> better uh, articles over the years, I suspect. Uh, I don't know if it's quite up yeah. there with marketing myopia, but. Uh, right, right. Exactly. Well, so he, he uh, Jim co-wrote a book called The Experience Economy, Work is Theater and Every Business a Stage, which if you haven't read it, uh, it's timeless. There's there's examples in it, obviously, that refer to certain things that maybe aren't happening, you know, anymore. It doesn't doesn't really matter um, because the, the the concept is so uh so powerful. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We'll circle back on that in a minute. But the other thing is um the latest book uh called Look, a practical guide for improving your observational skills, which is Fascinating, and I want to get into that a little bit too, because there's um, kind of an interesting um, event or uh, sort of group activity that that Jim's been doing um, in associate with association with the contents from that book. So, so let's let's start with the experience economy, because as I said, um, it, it 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 just has legs and legs, um, and it's interesting. Do you think that? that people were using the word experience very much like they are now with user experience and UX and all that kind of stuff before you wrote this book? Oh, not, not in the same way. Um, it, it's being used in, in, in ways beyond what I think we even in, intended, but you know, words do matter. I, I do think part of the success of the experience economy besides uh, attaching itself or being about a long-term structural shift in the economy, which is why the book I think is enduring, to, 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 regardless of how many examples uh, continue to be in business or 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 not. But you know, we, we, what we basically articulated uh, in the book, you know, over 20 years ago, is that experiences are a distinct form of output, economic output. That experiences are as distinct from services as services are from goods. So we're not just talking about a premium service or um, excellent service. We're talking about something different in kind. So services being the activities that an organization would perform or put a price tag on if they're in the service business, that that's sort of what, what a company does, the activities, but experiences is time. It's charging. It's the, it's the, it's if, as an economic offering, it's charging for the time that people spend in some place or event like a trade show, charging both the exhibitor 
to, to spend time and charging the participant to uh, as well, but also just the time you spend with customers that you may not be charging for. So the, the design of experiences, thinking about experiences different in kind than services and, and certainly different than, than manufacturing. One of the things we did in the updated edition of the book, so the book was published in, let's do a little book stuff if we can as an author. The book was published, yeah, yeah. The book was published in 1999. Statistics from my own publisher, Harvard Business Review Press, uh, they shared with me some time ago, so this might be slightly dated, but I'm sure the order of magnitude is correct. About 10,000 business books published every year in English, and 90% of them will not sell 10,000 copies. And of those that do sell 10,000 copies, 90% of them will sell their 10,000 copies within the first six months, even certainly the first year, and then they're over. So a okay. lesson for your, for your listeners is don't buy any contemporary business books to at least six months, um, you know, and, you know, I mean, Harvard re-released our book in, in hardcover after 20 years. That's a, a rare thing. So, you know, for 10, 15 years, we, we, we sold well over 10,000 copies every year as people continue to discover the book as the message continues to, uh, to, to resonate. One of the things we did in the preface for the updated edition, which was released in paperback, and now that edition has been re-released in hardcover, is we identified five different directions in which experience thinking, uh, if you will, has gone since we published the book. One is in name only, which you start calling things you currently do and experience, even though you don't change anything. So instead of customer service, we call it a customer experience with no change in what you're doing. So I'm not an advocate of that, of course. Uh, that reminds me of... Um, right, everybody's uh, calling things experience, whether it's user it's, experience. It, right, or, I mean... Or, yeah, I, yeah, I do. Everything's as, as an experience, you... and it does a disservice to it. Then there is uh, <laughs> exactly. there is experiential marketing, a term that actually did not exist. We wrote our book, and then Bert Schmidt wrote a book by that title. So that's ex applying experience thinking to marketing. So less uh, reliance on uh, traditional marketing and, and advertising, um, even in business business realm, but certainly in the consumer world and, and more event based. Uh, uh, marketing. So that's, uh, and even in B2B, I mean, traditionally the trade shows, the long established uh, event based um, marketing or experience marketing. But as companies uh, host their own events, you know, and they'll even sometimes even create their own venues. I don't long standing client of mine, Whirlpool, uh, open up a world of Whirlpool in Chicago. So instead of going to trade shows, in fact, they financed it um, by stop going to trade shows actually, and then use that money to have their own destination venue. So when clients are in Chicago, they could go to this environment and it's all demand creation, it's all traditional marketing, but having customers spend time in a place where unlike an appliance store, the appliances actually work. You can actually use them. You can turn them on kitchen vignettes that actually work. So you have experiential marketing, right? Places and events that create demand in lieu of traditional right. advertising. Um, the idea of uh, the application of experiences to operations, which some are calling a customer experience management or CEM, um, um, and, and not just not just CRM, you know, 2.0, but you know, actually applying experience thinking, thinking about the the customer's time moment to moment through operations, not just the activities that you perform. Then there's um, what, what Joe and I really care about, which is experience offerings, which is to charge explicitly for the experience, to make it your product, uh, if you will. And then there's the digital realm, which is everything I've already mentioned in the digital realm. So a name only, digital experiences, digital marketing experiences, digital operations, uh, digital charging for people to spend time at a on a game site or some other type of um, electronic uh, venue. So, uh, you know, it, it's clearly in, in the milieu today, it's, you know, people use the term, don't always think about what they mean uh, by it. And they're, they're, you know, other than a name only, they're all valid applications. We, there's some value to be added by, by thinking about demand creation or marketing from an event perspective. Um, there's value to think about operations, not just what you do, but how you do it, not just your activity, but rather the time your customers have interacting with your activity. And then, you know, clearly we encourage more and more or organizations think more and more about actually charging for experiences. And, and, and B2B, there might be challenging sometimes, but in fact, 
business business sometimes can have a greater opportunity <clears throat> um, you know to create a forum that you charge for. I mean, I've told companies, okay, you've got a you've got research going on, which you invest all that money in research and then hope to come up with some innovation on the back end that you can charge for. Well, why not charge customers or prospective customers a subscription to participate in your research? So you're charging for a learning experience over time and maybe they get first rights at the output or they get a discount in the back end or whatever it might might be. So there, there are different, uh, again, it's an economic offering. How do you charge for, for, uh, for time and not just for experience? And then of course I should add that in the book we wrote about what's after experiences as well, which I think has some real business to business implications, which is transformations. So we anticipated the, the buying and selling of change. My most recent Harvard Business Review article was January, February of last year, yeah, 2022. So th to give you that idea, it's, um, you know, there's five things you can sell, commodities, goods, services, experiences, and then we anticipated transformations as well. And here at B2B, it's not just charging for time, but can companies charge for demonstrated outcomes, a definition of a transformation? Uh, mo most clearly a consulting firm, which sort of charges for absolutely time yes. and materials. And sometimes they, I might argue they leave money on the table because if you could get a percentage of the results you achieve for your customer, um, you might make more money. Uh, you might actually help your customer increase revenue even more, cost cut costs even more. So, and that, that's not just consulting. I think a lot of business, can you charge for the ends and not the means? Every Peter Drucker once said, your customers are always buying something other than what you think you're selling to them. You know, they're all they're <laughs> always at one level of abstraction beyond, you know, somebody buys a pen or they get the writing service. So if you understand the value that you're creating for customers, can you charge explicitly for that value as an end and not just the means? So and sometimes doing so, I might argue, will actually help achieve that result better than letting the customer sort of have to piece together all the different services they acquire independently, as opposed to putting somebody in charge and not get, not get paid until they achieve the result. Well, putting your money where your mouth is, I mean, exactly. Risk, exactly. risk reward for sure. Right. I'll right. give an example of that again, not to do too much in transformation necessarily, but it's the golf pro that charges for lessons. They're charging for time, but you want to become a better golfer. Well, why not charge for that? Why not explicitly charge for reduction in handicap? Right now, the real the reason is because the golf pro would have to behave differently. They can't just show up for the lesson, and that's exactly right. But sometimes that that improvement is not achieved because the coach is not playing an actual round with you, analyzing your game more closely, giving you a wider portfolio of hand eye or coordination exercises or readings materials. And again, by analogy, any business. If you want to get paid for demonstrate outcomes, you're likely going to have to behave differently. You know, you and, and but again, you can always say, what are the results your customers are not achieving, right? That they're frustrated with, and could you could you address those by charging charging for it? And I, I sometimes think business to business has it is interesting has because there, it, actually it would force you a to understand exactly the starting point with every customer, which you can't you can't measure an end point without knowing what the starting point is. And second of all, it just forces you to understand the levers that you can or can't pull within that organization right. and the politics to do so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, you know, it can get complex, and especially in business, business relationships. But again, yeah, again, it's related to experiences because you know, that, that, that change only is affected by the experiences that you provide that are, that are under underneath. And, and maybe to put a bow on all this, the whole way we came up with this, this set of ideas is my co-author, Joe Pine, wrote a book called Mass Customization. And Joe, for years, was fond of saying, if you customize a, a good, you automatically turn that good into a service. So think Dell Computer before they lost their way. They, they never for, for decades, they never made goods and placed it in the inventory waiting right. for somebody to come along. They, they made computers in response to actual orders. They were computer-making service. Similarly, if you customize a service, you automatically turn that service into experience, customize the service, uh, customize an experience, turn that experience into a transformation. So that's sort of the, the big overall picture. So okay. All of our work, customization is woven in throughout um, 
throughout all our, our work. You know, so instead of mass production in your heart of hearts, wanting to do one thing for everybody to really right. understand the unique needs of individual customers, that's where that's where the next generation of value is to be found in our estimation. Absolutely. And I and I, I think that holds up regardless of, you know, we, there's been a lot of technology changes in marketing. There have been a lot of changes in the economy, the global economy. Now we're post-pandemic and supply chain short, I mean, all sorts of things. But still, at the end of the day, your your premise holds up. Yeah, yeah. you got you got to you got to create value. You know, when, when competitors are able to create the same value, then you become commoditized, and you got to find new ways to create value unless you have you know patent on something but uh, <laughs> right right yeah exactly. i mean it's uh that, that's short lived but yeah it's uh yeah it's 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 always business is always tough right so ho- hopefully the things we've written are helpful yeah frameworks and tools to help companies to think more richly about how they can create value in the world right well i think one thing that has always been i've always had a lot of interest in our conversations um has been that you have the ability to look at things in different ways um, more than um, many people that I've, I've ever met. Um, you know, a casual observer might call it, oh, he's so creative. Oh, he comes up with these ideas. But um, in your book called Look, I think what you're trying to do is to uh, instruct people that they can see things from different perspectives and angles and therefore um, come up with different observations and ideas and, and so forth from that. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, so the headline for the book look uh, is that all innovation begins with observation. You know, to see some pay, pay more close attention, noticing things, um, noticing the unfulfilled needs of a customer, even things they may not even realize for themselves, but they're, you know, you, Part of the early, my early interest in this area is you can talk to customers. There's all, a lot of people talk about this. I mean, what they say in focus groups or interviews is so preconditioned by what they've already experienced, and they may not even be the, the, aware of themselves. Um, so yeah, just to, to be more more observant, more and more time, of course, is spent observing what's on the screen, all of which is derivative, versus you know spending time observing direct, immediate circumstances. By the way, not just of your own customers, your own business, but not just your industry, if we do concentric circles, but just broader culture, just understanding what's, what's happening out there. So that's the premise. Um, I've dedicated the book to Edward De Bono. You mentioned creativity. I, I should, you know, a lot of people say, hey, Jim, you're so creative. And But yeah, I have to give homage to, maybe I had always had a, a, a propensity to try to seek the new idea, but Edward De Bono wrote a book called Lateral Thinking, which I discovered at a used a discount book rack one time and just changed my world. Um, you know, particularly this chapter where he bashes brainstorming. So brainstorming is so passive. It doesn't tell you what to do actively. You know, don't judge ideas, build on the ideas of others, come up with wild ideas, but doesn't tell you how to do any of that. So the, 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 the notion of deliberately and consciously moving to a new idea. And one of the things there, if I can, without getting into all the, the techniques of De Bono, but the notion of always looking for the underlying concept of what's going on. So you observe X is happening in the world, but what's really underneath that? You know, what, what's, what's, uh, in fact, if anyone wants to go get lateral thinking, there's an exercise in the book about how many ways can you divide a square into four equal psych, equal area pieces, something I have my students do. Most people come up with four, right? <laughs> they get stuck. Like, well, that's all there, that's all there is. But in fact, if you see underlying concepts, if you, not to give it away, if anybody wants to go try this, but if, if there, there are a dozen different underlying concepts, so once you see that, it opens up. In fact, there's there's multiple infinite set of answers to that 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 exercise. So once right. I devoted this to say like, okay, what's what's really going on here? What's go, and then you, you, you combine that with notion of all ideas of the bifurcation of two planes. Okay, here's what's going on here. Just take my own book, The Experience Economy, three chapters in the experience economy on the idea that work is theater. All right. So we take my you know, business acumen of working for Procter & Gamble. And I consulted for 10 years, largely in supply chain. OK, there's a field. But then go intersect that with with uh, knowledge from from theater. 
right? That you don't you don't interview people, you audition them. It's set design, you know, acting with intention. I mean, salespeople acting with intention, you know. Uh, right. I remember reading a theater book, uh, I which one book I got this from. Uh, oh, man, I should be able to achieve this better. But, you know, you perform blank in order to blank. That's how you define intention. So, for example, and again, perform blank, the activity, in order to blank, the intention. Classic example is you knock on the door to get anybody who might be in there. Or do you knock on the door? I assume you could hear that. My yes. dog. My dog heard that. <laughs> or do you do you knock on the door in order to get one person without disturbing somebody else? Whereas you do the task differently depending on your intention. So again, though, even just a salesperson, having presence, I mean, just being much more intentional about you know how, how you say things, what you do, how you enter a room, even what briefcase you have or business card or how you give the business card. That's all theater, you know. So again, a lot of new thinking simply comes by by the, inter, the intersection of two different disciplines. And again, a, a lot of that I got, I mean, in fact, De Bono, you know, that, that's, the, that's well known. A guy by the name of Alton and Kessler talked about bifurcation of two planes. But yeah, De Bono yeah. talks about take, take, take what you're interested in, what you want new ideas about. How do I, you know, how do I get this customer to buy from this? How do we close this deal? How do we get more business from customer A? De Bono will just, the bif- will pick just a random word is one of his techniques. So you just take something at random and have that collide on your topic and see what see what emerges. And that's a, you know, again, so once I discovered wow. lateral thinking, that just really solidified and I think helped me immensely. And I try to certainly teach my students. I encourage businesses and I dedicated and I dedicated look to De Bono um, because the inside the book is a tool called Six Looking Glasses, metaphorical tool for six different ways to look at the world. That might help you see things you might not otherwise notice without this contrived metaphorical lenses. Well, it was all inspired by De Bono's six thinking hats and also his book, Six Action Shoes, which has a similar metaphorical thinking caps or action shoes, planning your actions. So in some sense, look as a prequel to those two other two other books. And the other thing I learned from De Bono is just practical, simple tools. You know, any client I have or you have, you're never going to know their business as well as they know themselves. So my orientation is to give them new thinking tools. You take that combination, a new tool, a new framework, combined with business know-how, that's the winning. Again, that's a bifurcation of two planes as well. And then um, you teach this in um, some, I would say, I, I haven't been, well, I've been to a mini version of this um, uh, a a couple of years ago um, when you took a group through it, but there was an extended version that you have now. I don't know if you call it sort of like a, a seminar or a group. Project. We, do have a, we do have a certification program, which we do every, okay. every August. You can go, go to strategichorizons.com and check. That's a week long, not cheap. We basically go in depth through the, through the book. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I now teach a case Western, which is fun because now I get to experiment with new teaching techniques, but yes, but my, I teach a design course for, I mean, I guess I could pitch our part-time MBA program if anybody's watching. Of course, uh, yeah. Still, still uh, considering that. Uh, but I, the spine of that course is the design of goods, physical things, the design of services, activities, and then design of experiences, design of time. So that's the basic spine. But then I augment that with classes on observational skills, ideation skills, even conversation skills. I do stuff on presentation skills. So uh, I do that about adjunct for four years. That case, I just finished my sixth year full time, and then uh, undergraduate. I came on. I was adjunct. I came on board full time to basically reinvent management two hundred one undergraduate management. So there, that and I, what's sort of there is I sometimes when I teach a course, I think make, some of this stuff is basic, but it's basic that like everyday business people ought to be reminded of. And I start the whole course with a Peter Drucker quote: "The managers create the conditions in which others work." And that's a design issue. In other words, don't people don't want to manage people, but what are the conditions in which you you have an effective and efficient organization? So, you know, that's the whole headline for that. And then I, you, I mean, I have to do some basic functional things with students. But again, well, that I, certainly I, is a is a hot topic right now with um, the work at home um, uh, debate, exactly. as you might say, because it's a back and forth. But I mean, talk about ripple effect. I mean, and now every day we're reading about. I don't know to use the be dramatic and use the word collapse of commercial real estate, but 
certainly a lot of changes in commercial real estate because of um, that. And that those are conditions under which we work. And some people are loving those conditions. Some people not so much. Some managers like Jamie Dimon are back and forth on the whole thing. You, you, you can only force people to do so many well, things. Here's an interesting application for experiences. It's the workplace experience. In other words, yes. if, you're just, if, you're just, if you're just creating conditions where people do activity, well, the, act, the services they perform, who does it really matter where you spend time doing that? In other words, if if the if where you know experiences about um, places and events, it's about it's about it's it's place based. But if it doesn't matter what place the activities perform, how do you attract employees to spend time in a, in a collective effort? It's only if the time is a value. So the, 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 the office experience needs to be such that you get some value, you come up with thoughts, you get some uh, efficiency that you would not get unless you were to have it. And that's designing the time. And in fact, I have a client that's done work historically with conferences and external events. And now I've pivoted and say, well, how do we apply that same thinking internally? It's almost like every day is a conference in the office. You know, what, what's the wow. intelligence? What's the information you get? What's the networking? What are the things you traditionally go offsite to go like, no, that needs, we need to bring that every day. Or if we're going to ask people to come in two days a week, well, those two days can't be the same as what I could be doing at home. All you've done is wasted my time making me commute. Wow, so, that's really interesting. So I might even argue a, a transition period back is, is to fact have people come back just a day a week, but make sure you design that day to be fundamentally different in kind in terms of how employees spend their time versus versus spending it at home. If it's the same as what you spend at home, why would you want to go? I've, I've worked out ever since I left a larger firm, I've had a home office. I mean, I have a 30 second commute. That's nice. You know, um, you don't have to see below my waist what I'm doing here on Zoom. I can drink out of a red solo cup. Don't do that. Won't tell you what's in it. Um, you know, hard to do that in the workplace. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So so let me give you a. Uh, I'll, I'll just. I'm surprising you with this example, but you know, for the B2B world, if I'm a, if I'm a B2B marketing person, let's say I work for a ball bearing manufacturer. There's a big one in our region, um, and I sell you know my ball bearings to machine companies. Obviously, people who use ball bearings, right? Mm-hmm. How what's what's one of the the techniques from the the look book yeah. that could help somebody see things differently rather than just saying oh yeah uh, go and observe those people using your yeah. ball bearings or what what can they do that where they yeah. it's, a great, it's a great great question and we'll do we'll do observation then we'll talk about well, what else can they do but observation wise one of the techniques in the book this is simply to have a what I, what I actually call a curiosity list. So, and, and we can direct it. Like, what are you curious about in terms of your, your customers? And I use a, little, a very simple thing. I use the, the alphabet. I call it my A to XYZ list. XYZ is one bucket because there are tough letters. But for every letter of the alphabet, XYZ being one bucket, what are you curious to know more about with your customers? Do you have a list, right? So what are those, what are those 24? For, uh, four things and then go observe that. So ha- having a particular list of things um, is helpful. And, and if you struggle to come up with that list, it's like, well, why? I mean, you sh- in fact, I would argue you should have multiple lists. You should have multiple categories and every category. Like, let's just do deliveries. 24 things about deliveries you're curious about. You know, maintenance, 24 things about maintenance. You're invoicing, 24 things about invoicing you're curious about. Have multiple lists. Uh, so, again, I'm influenced by doing it. Know what you want ideas about, DeBono talks about. So what do you what do you want to have more observations uh, about? Um, the other thing I could uh, argue just even operationally is pick a different activity or pick a different place um, to just intensely look at. I've had a re- retail clients where I'll do something like every day pick a different spot to go look. And you'll see basic maintenance issues. Your basic maintenance. Now, I'll tell you an, an observational application um, that I just came across um, recently, and, and I think it, it'll it can look quite uh, quite to ball bearings as well. But a longstanding client of mine is uh, um, uh, a restaurant company out of Atlanta, and they're famous for uh, for a chicken sandwich. I've got you. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, 
And I was visiting recently when I was in Atlanta and I got a tour of Chick-fil-A's uh, Innovation Center. And they have all these awards up on the, on the wall for different projects. And one of which was clearly based on observation, which is for decades, operationally, when they made biscuits, they basically had this they have a sheet of dough and they just would stamp out the round biscuits. <clears throat> and then one day someone just looked at it and went, why are we using a circle? Because if all the extra edges around the circles, which either has to be re re put, you know, collected yeah, and redone yeah. on a sheet, or if things are too busy, actually disposed of, and said, so why don't we just use a hexagon so that there's no space in between the cuts? Millions and millions of dollars saved in 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 labor and or waste thrown away, and I mean, you just notice that the shape mattered. Okay, that's a biscuit, you know, it's back, but it's back in the house. I mean, to get close to ball bearings, it's back of the house. It's customers not seeing it. And when the dough rises, nobody can tell whether it's a circle or hexagon either way. It doesn't matter. Nobody sees it. That's sort of the way I feel about being B2B, by the way. There's a lot of stuff that the public doesn't see. Well, there's right. a, we don't back, see ball anything bearings. Back it's, of the house. Anything, here's something you're yeah. uh, what to go observe. What are other industries besides your own you can observe, even consumer businesses, where you can look at their back of the house? Because their back of the house is normally B2B, right? So oh, just because you're, no you're a B2B company, don't think you can't learn from consumer goods or consumer uh, uh, offerings. You can, because they have operations too. Absolutely. Uh, again, it, you know, it could be, I don't, I mean, I don't know ball bearing business, but you know, how many eaches are in a container and how much waste there is in opening up cartons or whatever, or just processing. Memex Procter & Gamble, I remember my, my, I left, uh, I got about a year in before I left when we first started to do total quality management cross functional teams and like okay yeah, tqm visiting actually visiting customers i was in logistics actually visiting a grocer's warehouse and seeing how they stack things and how they process things and i remember years later i was doing a, a project for wawa food markets outside of philadelphia it was actually a project to revisit all of their sourcing they had run out of capacity at their dairy they're like should we should we keep should we expand the dairy should we try to buy milk on the open market and the partners to whom i worked for at the time because i was still a junior bean uh, successfully said, look, let's do a total inbound rationalization project. Let's, re let's reevaluate, you know, who you're buying direct from, who you're buying from wholesalers and so forth. And I remember touring Miller Hartman wholesaler outside of Philadelphia and seeing uh, a case of bounty towels. And what was remarkable about this case of bounty towels, there was one on a pallet. So instead of smaller cases with 24 rolls inside, the case was the size of a pallet in terms of length, width, and height. And you took the lid off and grabbed eaches of bounty towels. And I'm sure it was a result of the work I'd done previous that I started when I was with PG and then left. If you just look, if you just observe how paper towels get handled at a wholesaler going to Wawa, you realize they cut the top of the cases off with a with a um, a, a knife. And sometimes there's damage because you'll cut the inner thing where well, you throw that away. It's it's, it's waste, right? And all the extra labor in terms of because you ship a whole case of bounty towels to an independent one Wawa store, it's like a three-year supply. You, they're shipping <laughs> eaches, but the packaging is not designed for eaches. So again, so it's that kind of operational thing. Just, just, well, just look how things are handled. Invoicing, you know, extra work. You, by the way, you can observe with your ears, listening on phone calls. You know, there's, you know, just observe what is going on. Sometimes I look at clients and they go like, "It's your business. Why are you? What? What? Why are you not doing? Why do you not have almost exhaustive knowledge?" of how everything happens. And this is my so, old PNG. So is, is, is there different. a difference between curiosity and question everything? Because they're related, of course. Right? They're, they're related, doing? right? So it's, again, I, like I tie... We have a lot of assumptions. Curiosity, right. What, we have a lot of assumptions. And 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 actually, you know, I've heard of, of techniques of reversing uh, hidden assumptions just to, just to see what would happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So again, it, it's uh, you know, you mentioned ball burnings, B two B. I mean, sometimes you can think it's mundane, but what's nice about B two B, in my view, is if you observe something, sometimes it's a lot easier to to make happen to affect the change mm. because sometimes you only have to find a single customer, right, that's willing to work with you that sees the better way that because maybe they have to make some adjustments too. But then you've got a built-in case study to convince customer two and customer three and customer four on down the the line. I mean, sometimes you're a consumer goods with the masses. You got to, I mean, for McDonald's to change anything with like over 20,000 stores, that's a monumental task, right? Because it has to be uniform across the whole 
thing. But B2B, you know, you, you can take your A customers, whatever, or your smallest customer and start there because they're they're hungry, whatever it could be. So sometimes if you can, it might be harder to come up with ideas. I think it is in the experience space. But if you come up, but once you come up with it, I don't know nothing besides observation, Dave, that's, I call this the, um, which I'd be remiss, remiss not to mention for your, for, for your listeners is that, or your viewers, um, I call this the, the most neglected but powerful idea in the experience economy, which is something we call customer sacrifice, right? What's that? Uh, right. Um, it's an ugly term. It's meant to be. Uh, some people might call it customer compromise, but customer sacrifice. And basically, it's, it's a metric uh, to layer on top of customer satisfaction. Most organizations realize you need to have satisfied customers. But if I use J.D. Power's definition of customer satisfaction, satisfaction is the, is the, the gap between what customers expect and what they perceive they get. Okay, so it's the gap between what customers expect and what they perceive they get. Perfectly good definition, good measure. You want satisfied customers, i.e., you want to meet expectations. But um, we think there's so much more value to look at customer sacrifice, which we define as the gap between what customers settle for and what they want exactly. So, so again, it's the gap between what customer, what each customer settles for versus what they want exactly. And customer sacrifice is created anytime you have a mass produced good or service or you do things one standard way for everybody because right. people people want certain dimensions. Now, you can't customize everything. Don't, don't think about customizing everything. You go broke doing that. But it's discerning what dimension of your offering, if customized, would get rid of sacrifice. The reason to customize, which is sort of the back, our background of our work, is because you have the greatest standard deviation of the exact way people want something, and you're doing it one way. And they would they value that dimension. And there's a world of sacrifice. Your ball bearing company, every company has got dimensions in which customers are selling for something other than what they want exactly. So part of it is to go observe and understand that with your customers. And I usually ask, What's the one dimension of sacrifice, if you were to eliminate, would create the greatest value? Don't get rid of it all and go on that journey looking for, you know, what is, what is it we're doing one standard way that, and got to understand, by the way, you have to understand individual customer needs to do that. And by the way, the, the, the term individual customer should be unnecessary. That's a redundancy. And the only reason I have to qualify the noun customer with the adjective individual is because they're not treated individually. <laughs> right? If they were all treated individually, I wouldn't have to use that term. But that's, again, that's work, right? Oh, we have to go understand individual needs. Yeah, that's exactly what you have to go do versus sitting back and do it one standard away the way you've always done it. Well, yeah, you can do that for a while, but after a while when the, you know, the negotiations, the price goes down and competition comes in, you need to actively be looking for ways to create new value, and it's out there. Sacrifice, I think, is a key. So a combination of observe, you know, yes. behave, yes. behaviors, behaviors, yes. and, and analyze sacrifice. And by the way, here's a, here's a connective tissue. You are not going to identify sacrifice by asking customers where they sacrifice. I've done that in the early days of this concept. You know, you know, I, mean, I, I tell I have a couple of stories I tell about sacrifice, and then I tell right. them. Basically, well, I won't tell the story, but and you just <laughs> ask customers, and they'll, like, where do you sacrifice? They'll go, I don't know. People, customers are so accustomed to not getting what they want exactly, they don't even know how to think about it. So you have Very to observe. Difficult. You have to observe. How do they jury rig something? What are their workarounds? What are things that they do? What do they discard? What, I mean, if, they're, if, they, if they, by the way, there's two kinds of sacrifice. Getting rid of all sacrifices of value to customer. But some sacrifice is because you're providing customers with too much. And that's wasteful. Yes. Everybody gets the same stuff in the box. What they can you cut back on? Right. So it can be really wasteful. You, you want to give customers, give me here's the mantra. You want to give customers only and exactly what they want. Wow. Right? And, and if you're giving away too little, then you have to provide more. But there's lots of times we're doing, we're providing customers more than they want giving more resources, more packaging that they want, and it would actually save money to understand the exact needs of customers. Yeah, I love it. 
I just got well, that, that's that, you know, that, 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 that concept that concepts in the experience economy, which uh, I guess I wish more people would take it, read it and take it to heart. So I buy my um, my coffee, like uh, Pete's coffee pods for the Keurig. I buy them in a, in a box that's like 75 of these pods in a box. I buy it from Amazon. And it used to be this box came in a bo- in a, in an Amazon box. And I'd open right. the box and then I'd take this big box out. A box in a box. Yeah. Right. Now it just right. comes in in... in in the actual box, in the coffee box, it doesn't say Amazon on the outside. It says Pete's Coffee, and there's an Amazon yep. sticker, and somebody just – and I'm thankful for that. Now, don't – you know, I'm sure we're, I'm going to get notes about how wasteful my coffee pods are. But I there's, there's other angles to that, including wasted coffee from, you know, making too much and, uh, yeah. and other things related. And, and, and even the uh, – the, uh... Paper filters. There's a B, there's a B two B changer because you know Pete's Coffee and Amazon had a conversation, probably about making Pete's box um, more stronger to withhold shipping. No doubt, no doubt about that. And that's a B two B conversation that they had. Yeah, saving, well, definitely saving Amazon money and saving them boxes. So, so right, we'll see. The, the, we'll the, see. The, the Who question knows about is Pete's? also saving Pete, but then Pete should similarly, you know, exactly. By the way, I, I, you do Pete's. Uh, if I can do a little coffee, but my son in law. Uh, turn me on to uh, community coffee. Okay, uh, in exp- I've got like a dark a dark coffee, and I, I I I can get two cups out of the one pod, so that'll 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 reduce your waste as well. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, just Our, don't just don't t- just don't lift the that, lid no. back. Don't don't lift the lid back up. So you want to keep that first hole, but I, I tell you, there's waste I, there. Is in fact in fact, um, people social assumption people think it's one cup per pod, not necessarily so. Interesting. I'm going to try it. So uh, the time has flown by and this has been um, fantastic. I have lots of questions and curiosities from even just our conversation as usual. But uh, uh, this was fantastic. Jim, thank you. So oh, you're welcome. Thanks for sharing Thanks for giving me your the time. time. Yeah, just fantastic. And, and um, what's the best way to reach you if anybody? Uh, strategic, StrategicHorizons.com, and you can take it from there. My man, Our managing partner is Doug Parker, and get a hold of him And he, if you have any interest in our certification program. Or go to Amazon, obviously, get the books. Or you're a better bookseller. Yeah, yeah high, highly recommend the look, Practical Guide for Improving Your Observation Skills. We talked about, obviously, the experience economy and strategic horizons thank you jim gilmore this has been the b2b marketing sales podcast and thanks for joining us we'll see you next time thanks thank you for listening to another episode of the one and only b2b marketing and sales podcast the source for b2b marketing and sales insight If you enjoyed the podcast, please be sure to subscribe and leave these old guys a five-star rating. Check the show notes for any links and contact information. You can always contact us by going to b2bmarketingsalespodcast.com. Thank you, and keep on marketing. Keep on selling.